first of all, I really obviously enjoyed the book, Centrist Knowledge. I have my copy here, uh, which you might not have realised, but you signed for me. Um, so I've got an author's signed copy, which I'm, I'm, very, I'm very pleased about. Um, and there is there is an awful lot that I agree with in there. And then happily also, as, as I've mentioned to you, there is there is some stuff that I disagree about um, and which makes for a good conversation. Um, and for people tuning in who haven't read it, it is incredibly engaging um, and it's kind of beautifully prismatic in drawing together all of these different thoughts by different thinkers from diverse traditions, um, including Yoruba thought. Uh, and my first question is, is kind of um, a little bit related to the, 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 the idea of traditions um, and what you're doing to disturb traditions in the book. And I think hopefully we'll kind of allow the audience also to get a, an insight into your specific view of what centrist knowledge is. So I'm just gonna kind of launch in if that's all right. Um, so in discussing different forms of knowing, you invoke the distinction between IQ and emotional intelligence and draw comparisons with the Yoruba division between Ogbon Ori, which is knowledge of the head and Ogbon Inu, knowledge of the gut. Now, as I read it, your aim was to present an alternative conception of knowledge to what you call Europatriarchal knowledge. Um, but I'm wondering if this distinction in some ways reinscribes the problematic mind-body dualism that we find in Descartes and, and all of the other, that gang. Um, and so the mind-body dualism for people who aren't, aren't familiar with it is just this, this idea that there is a very clear distinction between our cognitive capacities and our, and our kind of um, embodied experience. That's that's very broom broad brush strokes, but I think that gives the, the rough idea. Fantastic question. Thank you. And I'm really looking forward to, to getting into the, you know, the agreements and the disagreements that we may have during the uh, course of this conversation. So in terms of um, the, the Yoruba mythology of Ogbon, which is knowledge, um, I need to just preface and, and give some context before I get into that. Um, so as you mentioned, I, I use this phrase, Europatriarchal knowledge um, in the book. Um, and as the term implies, it is a way of approaching knowledge production that is biased toward Eurocentricity and male centricity. But the point of my book and of philosophizing in this way was not to critique Europatriarchal knowledge per se, because it's obvious um, to my mind that, you know, that biased knowledge is incomplete knowledge. And a lot has been said about those biases. But I wanted to look at what are the, the characteristics of Europatriarchal knowledge? What are the ways that it replicates itself and creates harm and, um, and, and uh, dominates? Um, and what I came to the conclusion was that Europatriarchal knowledge is um, is a way of knowing that is obsessed with reason and rationalization. And it, of course, you know, it's coming from the Platonic tradition um, where uh, the, these uh, reason was at the center of, of knowledge production. Um, and I'm, I, I, you know, I, I clarify in the book that I think that reason and rationalization are extremely important and without them knowledge production becomes indelicate but the kind of obsession and worship of these qualities um, leads to our our conventional ways of approaching knowledge um, in which we um, we try to explain things which cannot be explained um, through reason and logic with reason and logic. And so we put them into these narrow boxes. And even worse, we also just neglect those things um, because they don't fit into the boxes. Um, and, and this creates a robotic character to knowledge. And that of course is very fitting for extracting more than human nature and exploiting the bodies of, of, of groups of people that are deemed not to stem from this Platonic tradition, if you like, not to, not to come from communities or cultures where reason is seen as the God, you know. Um, so in my book, um, I, I look at, I, I first make these distinctions um, and then I contrast, um, so the, the behavioral psychologist, Daniel Kahneman, um, he has, in his in his book thinking fast and slow he uh theorizes about what he calls system one and system 
too, which are similar to what you mentioned. So um, reason and or IQ and EQ. Um, and he creates, because to the extent that your patriarchal knowledge does acknowledge um, that there are things that can't be understood through logic, it creates a hierarchy between them. Um, so then it, it, it does create these theories such as system one and system two, or IQ and EQ, et cetera. Um, and that is the context into which I then um, introduce sensuous knowledge. Um, and I start off with this, um, uh, foundational mythology of the Yorubas, which leads to the way that we, my heritage is Yoruba, um, intellectualize. And in, and in this um, foundational mythology, there's a story about Ogbon Ori and Ogbon Inu, which, as you said, translated mean literally knowledge of the head and knowledge of the gut. So kind of emotional and intellectual intelligence. Um, but the point is that in, in the Yoruba epos, um, you cannot separate between the two. There is no hierarchy between the two. To have only one is to just be part wise. Um, so it's very different uh, from EQ and IQ, if that makes sense. And, and sensuous knowledge is, is following that tradition and saying that there needs to be a synthesis in which there isn't a kind of dualistic or hierarchical dualism. That's so, I mean, it's so interesting. And again, I'm fortunate that uh, we've got a, a limited time frame to talk about this. I guess one um, quick thought on that is that, um, and I think I mentioned to you this, this to you in a previous conversation, is that um, there are uh, thinkers like Michelle Duff uh, who um, see uh, the patriarchal spin on knowledge as being um, like depressingly flexible, such that in the Romantic period, for example, it was intuition which was celebrated, and men were seen to be very kind of like intuitive and in touch with their emotions, and uh, women were figured as kind of bean counting home um, economics rationalists. So I, I suppose I, I am wondering how uh, mutable. Um, Ogbon Inu and Ogbon um, Uri are in re in relation to Yoruba. I mean, I I'm um, I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly ignorant of Yoruba tradition, so I just wonder how maybe that plays out in relation to um, patriarchal norms. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's so interesting. I'm not familiar with with her work, unfortunately, but I, I can I can see how that would easily happen within the context of Euro patriarchal knowledge because there is that um, embedded hierarchical binary thinking. So you can, you know, potentially swap things around in a different kind of realm and tradition and say that, yeah, women are the ones who are more rational than men and, and, and therefore um, emotionalism is, is superior to rationality because it's taking place within patriarchy. Um, in terms of Yoruba, like the mutability of that. Um, I mean, the first thing to say is that, you know, we, the, the Yorubas um, are in a part of the world and in, widely spread in, in the diaspora um, that has been colonized. And so there isn't a kind of, uh, you know, a, a trajectory through which we can trace how that philosophy would, would have manifested without the interruption of colonialism and enslavement and things like that. Um, but I do still, you know, I, I, um, I grew up in, in Nigeria and I spend a lot of time there still. And, and in a lot of the intellectual work that is produced and in also in the art and in the, like the philosoph philosophies and metaphysics, um, there definitely is much more of a, of a malleability um, to, to knowledge production. Fantastic. Maybe that's something that we can kind of come back to. I'm making a list of uh, further questions, but uh, I'm just going to press on with the with the, the list that I've got here. Um, and I suppose um, one thing that came to mind while reading it is that you strike a very kind of strong stance in relation to the um, norms and practices, academic norms and practices, and the terms that are often used. Um, and so while in the book you coin certain terms like Euro patriarchal knowledge, um, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this correctly, but exuisance, uh, is that 
Exusions. Ex oh, okay. Yeah, you, you said it much better. Uh, because you coined, I suppose, because you coined it. But so this is the kind of branching flow of power. Um, so you you have you coined these terms, but you also want to avoid using jargon like epistemic violence um, in, in quote marks. Um, and you quote Bell Hooks saying, any theory that cannot be shared in everyday conversation cannot be used to educate the public. Um, so on the one hand, epistemic violence, you know, this is, this is a difficult term and it may be exclusionary, but on the other hand, it's important to create new terms. And, I, and, and in creating new terms, it seems like you're sympathetic to the kind of deconstructionist thoughts of people like Gayatri Spivak, who think that everyday language that we use might import certain Europatriarchal norms. Um, and I guess this raises a question, and I think it's, you know, the proof is in the eating of the pudding, uh, where the pudding is your book, which you shouldn't eat, but is very good uh, in, in demonstrating how you can talk in an accessible way um, without necessarily using the language of uh, the oppressor, as it were. Um, so, yeah, I guess I just wanted, uh, it would be good to know your thoughts on that. Yeah, wonderful. Um, I am sympathetic to deconstructionist work by people like um, Spivak, Gayatri Spivak. Um, I guess maybe the first thing I should say is that I think I, I'm, I think I'm quite, you know, admittedly romantic about language. <laughs> um, I think language is I, I, I view its poetic capabilities. Um, they're quite at the forefront for me when it comes to writing and theorizing and just thinking. Um, and maybe that partly is because I'm multilingual. I, I, I speak or have spoken at various points in my life, forgetting many of them now, but I speak five languages. And, um, and I have lived in many countries and, you know, for instance, Swedish and Finnish are two languages that I speak and German and Spanish and English are the other three. And I, I often, you know, I find that I, I have different personas to some extent in, in each language. I tend to have a similar kind of dream if it's in Swedish and if it's in Finnish, it's something else. Um, all to say that uh, I think the distinction between language that is accessible vis-a-vis -vis language that is jargon um, is probably not how my brain, like it's not a distinction that I can really make. Um, I think what the, the distinction I would make and why Bell Hooks is, um, why I refer to what she said, that theory must be available um, to people if it's going to, to create social change, um, is a distinction between um, the, the kind of, um, how do I put it? So the, the knowledge that is assumed versus knowledge that is explained. Um, I think the problem with terms, phrases like epistemic violence is not that, you know, it's a very useful term. When Spivak wrote about it, she was talking about um, how the subaltern, um, by which she meant, you know, people in, in the global south, indigenous people, people who have been colonized, that their, their ways of knowing um, had been erased. Um, and she calls that, I mean, it's a very complex paper for those who haven't read it, but, and those who have know what I'm talking about. Um, but, you know, so I'm simplifying tremendously here, but she, she refers to that as epistemic violence. And that is, you know, that's, that's beautiful. That's almost poetic to me. Um, but when it is assumed, for instance, when people use it on Twitter or something without the, the, the full kind of explanation of what that term means, um, then it loses um, a lot of its, its potence for change. It can still be valid in other ways, but it, it may not. Um, yeah, so in, in some sense, it's, I, I, I think a lot of phrases like this have moved away from being um, descriptive and epistemological to actually being almost psychological, um, almost like an, a kind of pathological way of identifying with social norms or social constructs. So they're kind of signifiers. Yeah, well, this is the kind of like, yeah, a signal like method of, of, some, of some description. Is that the thought? Yeah, and really this thing of like, they, they're meant to be analytical, descriptive, theoretical words. And what is happening is that they're being absorbed 
I think psychologically in some way. And I see that as doing harm to the people that they're meant to be aiding toward liberation. Um, because it's, you know, you can almost start to live in this, this bubble of uh, where you analyze your own persona through the lens of epistemic violence or something like that. And I don't think that that was the point of it. So right. yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm exploring that kind of space in the book. Yeah, fascinating. I just, so I suppose this also puts uh, us, you and me in this instance in quite a particular position because as Anthony mentioned at the start, this is, you know, this is a public space. Um, and I suppose rather than me asking more questions about this, I would definitely invite audience members to kind of press uh, or press questions if there are things that aren't making sense in, in the way that we're talking. And I guess that's that's one of the important things is that the, the conversation can extend into the public sphere and the conversation isn't just, you know, two talking heads, but it's it's a matter of inviting questions in the, in the Q&A, which will start uh, in 10 minutes. OK, so that gives me. <laughs> <laughs> some more time for some another question so um and i think this is this is one of the um this is one of the points that uh i'm not sure i'm not sure if i disagree with you about it but i definitely would love to hear more about your thoughts on the relationship between knowledge and power um and as i understand it you think knowledge is active and productive and includes kind of both rational argumentation and creativity in the kind of most capacious sense of that term, which in, in, includes all forms of artistic creativity. Um, so uh, this is this is how you make sense of the quotation from Audre Lorde, poetry is not a luxury. Um, and I think a lot of people would agree with you, um, in, including me, but simultaneously, um, alongside that picture, you see power or, or the coming to power as an antidote to passive inaction. Um, and uh, I'm wondering how you would incorporate the thought which is articulated by Charles Mills, and in fact, something that Darren Chetty and I uh, talk about and, 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 and kind of feature the articles that um, focus on this um, in, that, in the special, in the issue uh, section in the special issue that Anthony mentioned at the start. Um, so articulated by Mills and Linda Martin Alcock that ignorance and specifically white ignorance is a form of oppressive power. So knowledge isn't just about production kind of activity, but it's uh, in oppressive systems that can feature as erasure um, and forms of unknowing. Uh, this is the kind of sometimes referred to as epistemology of ignorance. Yeah. There's, there's so much in that question to unpack, um, uh, but I want to attempt it because I, I think it's a great question. Um, but I, I was just in, in reference to what you said before asking the question, I wonder how, how clued in people are on like, you know, uh, Mills's work on white ignorance. Um, but I very much enjoyed, I, I was lucky to read a, a sampler of uh, the interview that you did with him and it's, it's fantastic. Um, I think maybe just this phrase, knowledge is power, that's, uh, you know, so popular is an interesting place to, to hopefully respond to your question in a useful way, um, because it, it speaks to the tension between knowledge and power that, and ignorance and things like that, that I, that I too um, am really interested in. And what interests me is how, uh, you know, knowledge is power was um, allegedly coined by Francis Bacon. And uh, he meant it literally like you know this was a time of european expansion and 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 exploration of the rest of the world and bacon was saying that yeah the more knowledge we have about the rest of the world the more sort of authoritarian power um europe would have or or britain um to be specific and um but then knowledge is power has also been used and is used uh, by liberation movements, especially in the Black liberation movement. Um, and so there's an interesting tension between the, between the, the, in the relationship between knowledge and power. Um, and it speaks to how um, power is seen as synonymous within the context of conventional Europatriarchal knowledge, power is seen as uh, synonymous with things like authority, violence, dominance, coercion. Um, and I have found in my work over the over a decade now, um, doing the work that I do, that so much of 
uh, the feminist project, black liberation movements, pan-Africanism and so on get stuck because we're still using the same definition of power. So, so even while we're trying to uh, change the structures of power, we're using the same language. Um, and so, yeah, that was um, why I wanted to, why I coined the, the term um, exusions that you mentioned earlier um, as a way of unlearning that definition of power and reimagining something else. Um, but of course, there is a, there are all of these, um, these, these tensions are embedded into it. And, and insofar as um, uh, why ignorance is concerned, I, I very much agree with Mills. And I've, um, I, I wrote an essay for uh, World Literature Now about something that I called Goldilocks syndrome, um, which in which I argue basically um, and briefly that um, where people of color are, uh, you know, one of our key focuses in modern times has been decolonization of the mind and et cetera. Um, for white people, um, there is an equal brainwashing that needs to be unlearned. Um, and, and that's what I refer to as the Goldilocks syndrome, which is very similar to, to Mills's white ignorance to the yeah. extent I understand it. Yeah, no, that's, yeah, that's, that's really helpful. Um, and, I, and I feel like possibly if there's time in the, in the Q&A, um, learning more about your um, reconstruction of the notion of power would be wonderful. Um, but for the time being, I'm going to press on with, uh, uh, with, with some um, other questions, just to try and catch as much as I can in the, in the conversation. Um, so you, you're critical in the book of what you call superstitious thinking, um, but you also uh, appear, um, for the reasons that we've discussed, to, 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 want, uh, to include uh, non-rational modes of thought, um, such as inspiration, and you talk about automatic writing at one point, um, and intuition. Uh, and there's this passage where you, you talk about a woman placed in nat nature automatically wanting to touch the trees and lakes and so on. Um, and I guess to a certain extent that's that's poetic license. But also I think that there is, there is something um, that uh, doesn't perhaps kind of determinately fit in um, um, on Bon Inu or Bon Ori, which is this the the kind of unconscious to a certain extent, and so I was wondering where the unconscious fits in um, to your to your picture. Also, because you mentioned Young on a couple of occasions, um, Carl Gustav Young, and um, you know, obviously he's he's a kind of controversial figure in some senses, but yeah, he deals with the unconscious and the, and the social unconscious. So I was wondering where the unconscious figures in sensuous knowledge. Mm, great question. Um, I, I don't think I mentioned Young, though. I should just clarify that. Um, if oh I do, it might just be once, because I haven't read any Young, so I wouldn't um, want to, to delve into his. But I, but I think, I'm, I mean, obviously, I've been um, inspired by him through others <laughs> who are inspired by him um, and friends and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but yes, the unconscious, I guess, I mean, I think that there is a... Uh, uh, it's it, it's important to clarify that there's a difference between superstition, which I think is always rooted in fear of the unknown, and um, inspiration or even intuition. Um, and in the instance where uh, I experienced what I learned was called automatic writing, where you sort of lose control of of your hands and uh, unwillingly or <laughs> um, as though by some greater force are writing. Um, I mentioned in the book that, you know, this happened to me in my twenties, um, that I would perhaps think of it as something different today if, if that happened to me today. And if that even were possible to happen to me today, I don't know. Um, so I am, I, I think I'm kind of interested in understanding the irrational rationally if that makes sense um and but and and part of that endeavor is the observation that um things like intuition and the experiences i describe of women um you know feeling more comfortable at least to to hold trees and flowers and um and dip their their feet and hands into lakes if they come across them um these are things that that do happen you know these are this is the the reality that i observe around me um i also observe 
that you know we live in a society which prides itself in the West of, of being so rational and logical, and yet you know you have apps like Headspace with millions of downloads. You have people who are into you know yoga and Buddhism and Kabbalah, and um, there's there's so evidently an astrology and things like that. There, there's so evidently a, a, a pull um, towards something that reason and rationality rationality are not explaining for people. Um, and so, yeah, um, I, I really wanted to grapple with that because sensuous knowledge as, as the, the phrase hopefully implies is, you know, something that's grounded in, in, in earth, in reality. It's not sort of um, in the otherworldly platonic um, realm or something. Um, and also um, the black feminist tradition, which is where I come from in terms of my, my knowledge and intellectual school of thought, um, you know, people like Toni Morrison, Bell Hooks, Alice Walker um, have, have always taken the right, if you like, made themselves entitled to being able to write hyper-rationally and theoretically and analytically, but also, um, yeah, looking at the unconscious and bringing that into the space of knowledge production. Yeah. Wonderful. So, yes, I have a I have a lot of thoughts on this, but I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to um, I'm going to move over to the the questions that we've got. Um, but thank you so much for that. Um, so Joanna Damato, uh, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, but has said uh, this has been a great conversation. Thanks, uh, Mina. What kinds of questions would philosophers be asking if they adopted the more capacious, sensuous knowledge approach that you describe, rather than the narrower framework favoured by epistemologists and philosophers more generally? Um, and I guess that uh, is uh, analytic philosophers, um, uh, based on uh, Anthony's introduction. Thanks for the question. Um... So much, I think, but maybe um, above all questions that 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 are applicable to to people's lives. Um, philosophy that isn't um, you know entirely abstract. And I do think that there's a, a place for abstraction, and I, I, I love theory. Um, you know, evidently, I'm, I'm engaging with that myself. But um, I think, yeah, a, a more grounded philosophy that also acknowledges um, what we've been talking about, the, the non-rational, um, the, the body embodiment, um, things like that, uh, that, that. I guess that validates a kind of inner empiricism as well. And I don't just mean that on, the, on an individual level, but also, uh, you know, on a societal level, the, the the hopes and fears and desires um, that we have as a as a social entity, um, and even furthermore, not only as as humans, but in our uh, ecosystems, you know, the deeper explorations of those kinds of questions, I think, would become yeah. prominent. This is this is one of my uh, questions. So, abuse as, as facilitator, but I guess. Um, I, I'm, I'm thinking about um, the alignment of, of Europe patriarchal knowledge and, and rationality and reason um, and thinking about what you were saying about um, people looking for alternative forms of knowledge um, in um, yogic practices or, or Buddhism. And, and, and I suppose one uh, might say that the, the, that type um, alignment, that type association between Europatriarchal knowledge and reason and rationality um, is to um, the exclusion of, um, you know, huge wealth of um, deeply kind of like sophisticated rational argumentation that is found in other cultures. So I, I guess I just wanted to, yeah, just to, to kind of like touch base on that, on that as a, as a thought. Yeah, yes. Um... You could easily get me going on that. Um, <laughs> definitely. So, I mean, I think so much of, first of all, the kind of the specious denial of those, um, this kind of uh, secret pursuit of, of mysticism in the West um, serves to uh, uphold the myth of, you know, of whiteness, of, of Europatriarchy as, uh, you know, as superior 
to others, um, to other knowledges in the world where people are not as rational and they obviously care about the mystical. We don't even well, you know, clearly <laughs> that's that's happening here in, in Western society as well. Um, and then the flip side of that, which uh, is what you're pointing to is, um, I've, I've recently read a, a book by David Graeber and David Wengro, which um, has been quite popular. I'm sure many of you have heard of it. Um, the dawn of everything. Um, and they speak about uh, what they call in the indigenous critique. Um, and they show how um, indigenous communities, you know, going as far back as the 15th century, um, if not earlier, um, have provided critiques of the irrationality in Western epistemology. Um, it's such a, a wonderful book that I really uh, warmly recommend. Um, and it helped me articulate um, what I too have, have felt that there is, you know, it's either the kind of um, uh, diminishment of, of knowledge from other parts of the world, or then there's a kind of uh, uh, fetishization or romanticization of like everything that's indigenous is, is good. Um, and we must now use that to kind of assuaged the pain of, of Western um, imperialism. Um, but actually what we need to do, and this, this goes back to the question that someone in the audience asked of what philosophy can help do, is to engage critically with, um, as you say, you know, so many sources of knowledge that exist around the world. Um, and that means to, um, to critique it, to see where it's valuable, to just really engage in uh, in dialectic uh, conversations. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. So we've got we've got a few more questions. Um, Alex uh, Z or Z, depending where in the world. Uh, I think we need to draw a stronger distinction between questions of knowledge and moral questions. Many cultures, not just the West, recognize that knowledge involves violence. Think, for example, of Hindu monks seeking divine knowledge through asceticism and self-denial. As Nietzsche observed, Western science has the same ascetic structure. I think the question we need to be asking is how to make moral use of the immense power that Western knowledge has opened. How do we use our immense capacities to benefit the entire world and no longer commit the atrocities of the past? Um, is, is the question available to me to see as well? Because there's this. Uh, there's a lot there, isn't there? Yeah. yeah. I, uh, I don't know how to do that. But yeah, I, I can see it. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> thanks. Um, yes. Um, okay. I, I probably won't read it very thoroughly just because we don't have that much time but I think I understood the gist of it and um, part of what I'm uh, trying to when I'm when I said earlier that I'm, I'm looking to understand the, the what are the characteristics of Euro patriarchal knowledge um, one of the things that this obsession with with reasoning um, creates is uh, a a feeling or a belief that we can, um, how can I put this? That we can we can um, make moral decisions um, through logic, which often isn't the case. Um, and so I would disagree that there is an immense. Um, how did you put it? Um, th like the that the that the Western canon would somehow have this this. Um, you know, be a compendium of for uh, of a moral compass or something like that. Because you know, with when it comes to questions about ethics or morality, it's always um, deeply subjective. Um, and so, you know, what we might consider, what Nietzsche might consider, and those of us who are uh, descendants of that kind of school of thought, um, to be uh, an, an upright moral. Uh, value is not necessarily going to be the case in other parts of the world. And so again, as I said, in response to the previous question, I think it is that like engagement with each other's theories from a place of, of um, not respect, what's the word I'm looking for, of, of, um, uh, of wanting to learn, of, you know, of maturity, really, uh, um, neither standing above nor below um, when it comes to yeah. dialogues. 
engage reciprocity and kind of yeah interest yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, that's a hard agree for me um so uh moving on to uh, so uh, linda lapina uh, has said thank you so much for all your work and the great conversation i'm wondering about what you uh mina said about superstition coming from fear in relation to different knowledges and knowledge systems who is it who would distinguish superstition from knowing and then in brackets differently Oh, what a great question. Thank you. That's that's really stimulating. Um, yeah, exactly. Because we, you know, it's easy to um, to make the judgment that, um, yeah, that what another group of people um, see as knowledge is actually superstition. Um, I don't think that that is something that we should do, but I do think that there's a, um, you know, in terms of observing and engaging dialectically um what what we i'll speak you know from my position as a as a night someone of nigerian heritage um and a society where i've seen a lot of superstitious beliefs um you know take hold in really frightening ways and they're very often connected to um poverty uh patriarchy imperialism so you know, the big ills of the world, um, because that creates lives in which people live in states of fear um, and despair and hopelessness. And then there is a propensity toward uh, the superstitious. Um, but of course, it's there's something about superstition that is also, um, you know, uh, 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 is a situated kind of um, practice. So it's 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 not something I think you can have a blanket um, view about. Yeah, yeah. So we also have um, Naomi Shaman uh, who has asked, uh, who has said it can be important that our um, theorists' language be lived in, that is uh, resonant with sensuous ordinary life. But I was struck by Mina's warning against our coming to live in our theoretical language, internalizing it. It's coming to shape our inner lives. Maybe the point is to attend to whom we're living with, listening to, learning from, attentively, attentively intermeshed with, identifying with, and caring about. Does that seem like, yeah? Yeah, um, I mean, I just mainly very much agree with that. I think, you know, that's, and that's part of what I, what, how I define sensuous knowledge is, you know, it's, it's a kind of dynamic approach to knowledge, which ultimately helps give, us clarity and the ability to be discerning um, and and to see knowledge um, not as this uh, overarching superior thing that we need to be fed from authoritative figures but as as something that we are in relationship with in a dynamic kind of way so knowledge as a as a living breathing entity of sorts um, and that does precisely mean that you know we if in the in so far that we we start to embody what we know um, in the same ways maybe that we think of our our bodies as sanctuaries when it comes to what we what food we eat or uh, you know how we cleanse or do self care or whatever it might be um, that kind of sentiment toward the knowledge that we imbibe as well um, is 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 definitely something that I think is really really important especially in times when there is so much um, information yeah 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 and i think actually following on from this there's, there's a, a question from leanne deborah hi leanne who i know um so do you think over time as the world becomes more aware of other cultures society as a whole will begin to shift from reason and logic uh to the opposite so i guess i mean and, and for me that feels really interesting and important because of the the trends that we see in 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 the kinds of knowledge production and i guess it alludes to the um, that conversation about romanticism and michelle de death earlier as well um i think i would need to unpack this question a little bit because um who is referred to as the world um becoming more aware of other cultures, you know, that would almost, if taken literally, it would mean that we as a species are, are encountering um, species from another planet or something. Um, I think we're all in this together. That's what I want to say. I don't think that this is a question that, you know, the, just the binary between uh, 
rationality, logic versus the emotions, etc., is like you know one part of the world has one and another part the other. Um, I think we just basically all are in quite a mess, um, and and nobody has really figured it out. Um, but also each group of people have figured something out. Um, and that was why I shared Ogbon in my book, you know, imagining an audience, a, a readership that may not know that there is this kind of synthesizing thinking about knowledge in one part of the world. Um, Europatriarchy, I write in the book, um, is not entirely negative. You know, it is it contributed to the enlightenment without which we wouldn't have things like modern universities and encyclopedias and airplanes and stuff. So, um, so you know, Europatriarchal knowledge has contributed with a lot of things that make our, that, that enrich our lives. Um, but every part of, every culture has done that. Um, so, so it's really coming to that place of understanding that I think can help us moving forward. Yeah, and also for the audience members who didn't hear, we're in quite a mess. I feel like that's a <laughs> wonderful <laughs> tagline. Um, so, um, Ronald uh, Tuch or Tuch, uh, I taught English for many years. How can we incorporate this kind of thinking into institutionalized versions of knowledge? Um, should students be permitted to interpret a poem in a, in, in a way they personally feel is good for them, or should there be an overriding system to define legitimate and illegitimate interpretations? Um, yeah, so the problem begins with education itself. Yeah, um, I mean, when I think back to how I have learned um, all of the, the knowledge that has given me clarity in life, um, it, it's, it, it does become clear to me that it has a kind of uh, sensuous character, you know, it isn't um, only theories and um, analysis, but it is also, as you mentioned, you know, uh, poetry, it's, it's music, it's the arts, it's nature. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, getting a, 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 an educational system in which sensuous knowledge were applied um, would seek and use that kind of uh, prismatic dynamic view of knowledge from a very early age um, so that we don't teach children uh, to think in binaristic ways, um, and worst of all, to become really robotic and alienated from, from themselves and their own feelings. Um, what is tricky is this question of, um, I'm trying to find your question, but I think you used the word legitimate um, and illegitimate. Um, okay, I can't find your question, but um, it's, yeah, I, I, I think, um, no, we shouldn't have an overriding system. That's that's the problem. Uh, you know, overriding systems are typically the problem. Um, education is not about teaching children formulas. There's, it's useful when it comes to maths or physics, of course. There's a place for formulas. But um, the, the majority of education and of being an educator is uh, being able to teach complexity, to teach processes, to teach syntheses, um, those kinds of things. So, yeah. So I think this relates to um, a question which was asked earlier and has been asked again by a mysterious anonymous attendee uh, who wants to know how you think art produces knowledge. Um, so, and, and, and particularly music. Yeah, so um, as I was just saying, when I think about what I, the knowledge that I possess um, or that I engage with and that I have available to me, um, it, it comes from such various sources. And in the book, I use um, uh, Lauren Hill's, one of her albums, um, which I see as a treatise on liberation. Um, you know, I use, I use that as a source um, just as much as I use uh, you know, a text by Bell Hooks or Immanuel Kant or something. Um, People like that, people like Fela or the art of, uh, the, there's a, a black feminist artist called Mikaelen Thomas. Um, and it just so happens that, you know, for me, when I look at her art, I can feel my, my knowledge expanding. Um, uh, being in nature is a way of gaining knowledge. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, I mean, that is exactly what sensuous knowledge is, is it's, you know, not creating the hierarchy between, um, deductive 
reasoning and say uh, what a river can teach us about power. So this, I mean, again, uh, relates to another question which has been asked by um, Daniela Machado. Um, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on how, on how we might be able to philosophize sensuously or if this is possible or desirable. And I get, I mean, I guess in the back of my mind is how I was, uh, how, you know, I was trained in philosophy, which is in seminar rooms, uh, a far cry from um, being somewhere in nature. There's just kind of white, um, you know, walls surrounding me. Um, so yeah, no, that would be, yeah, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um... I, th I think, you know, as I we spoke about earlier, like philosophy, expanding what philosophy is looking at, um, the kind of the inner world um, interiorities, if you like, of, um, of knowledge itself, but also of lived experience. Um, and to do that, we, we do need to bring in the arts because uh, there's, there are some, uh, some, questions that are intrinsic to philosophical inquiry um, that are better explained by art, um, or not better explained, um, but explained just as well. So for example, freedom is a question that is of intrinsic value to philosophical inquiry. And dance, for example, um, is able to actually sort of sensuously philosophize about freedom in a way that writing about freedom, as anyone who has attempted to do that knows, <laughs> is incredibly difficult. Um, you know, it's just such a slippery thing to try and, and, and grasp and, and, and create a formula around because that's not what it's, it's supposed to do. Um, so yeah, uh, I think, you know, why not have philosophy students not just be surrounded by white walls, but go out and, and watch a dance show or something and then come back and apply, you know, whatever they've been reading to, uh, you know, into the conversation around it. Would it, would it be a matter of applying um, what you've been reading or, or would the um, engagement with the dance be the philosophy itself? Yeah, um, perhaps it would. I mean, you know, who knows until until it's done, but I certainly would, uh, I mean, I just personally know that if I were to study philosophy, I would love to do it that way. Um, and I think, you know, it, it could really enrich um, what is the, 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 the pursuit of knowledge, which is what philosophy ultimately is. Yeah, so it's this kind of form of experiential learning that you yeah that you don't typically have in uh, philosophy seminar rooms gosh we've got a lot of questions to get through i'm going to see if i can um in the last four minutes uh, actually no so um joanna sings you've had a question already i'm going to skip over you but hopefully if there's time afterwards we'll come back to this but koshi tharakam um says perhaps the problem with the euro patriarchal knowledge is that it orients itself entirely on the cognitive dimension of knowledge as against the cognitive model some of the asian traditions emphasize the experiential model of knowledge gandhi for example advocated the experiential aspect of moral knowledge through his philosophy of nonviolence. does sensual knowledge resonate with this idea of experiential knowledge gosh there's yeah a lot there <laughs> Yeah, but yes, um, the short answer is yes, it, it definitely resonates with the idea of experiential knowledge. And um, I think, so one thing that I find really interesting, um, and I've been thinking about recently is how um, in, in a lot of conversations at the moment um, about philosophy, about sort of global philosophy, there seems to be a tendency to equate um, uh, Buddhism with Stoicism, say, and different schools of uh, Western philosophy. Um, and I think that the two are very different. Um, so actually in a lot of, um, in meditation anyway, as I experience it, um, and, and to my understanding of a lot of Eastern thought, um, what happens in meditation in, I mean, first of all, there's a kind of argument that that wisdom is to be found in stillness. Um, and to the extent one buys into that, then that kind of stillness can be achieved through meditative practices. Um, what happens uh, in, in meditation is that you switch off the cognitive. Um, you, you, you switch off 
reasoning and rationalization and basically thought. Um, so, so reason becomes a kind of nemesis of achieving stillness. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, that kind of the, the cognitive can be very important when it's applied to the, to the parts of, of human and social life where it is needed, but it is also a huge distraction when it comes to, to wisdom.